Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Rajiv Seigel. I'm a co-section chair of the NAS section on spinal cord injury. Uh, and today I'm uh, joined by my section co-chair, uh, Dr. E. Liu, Dr. Michael Failings, Dr. Brian Kwan. And we're happy to talk to you about the new AO spine praxis uh, guidelines on spinal cord injury. Hi, uh, my name is E. Liu, and I'm from Brigham, uh, at Boston, uh, one of the neurosurgeons there, and I'm co-chair with Rajiv and uh, Mike. I'm uh, Michael Failings, professor of neurosurgery at the University of Toronto. I'm chair of the NAS Evidence-Based Medicine Committee, and along with uh, uh, Brian Kwan, we are the co-chairs of the um, AO Spine Praxis Guidelines effort. And I'm Brian Kwan. I'm a professor of orthopedic surgery at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. And I've uh, been pleased to co-chair this effort on the AO Spine Praxis Guidelines with uh, Professor Failings. And we're happy to be talking about them here at NAS. So I, I thought maybe we could start talking about uh, how these uh, recent guidelines came to be. There have been a handful of uh, guidelines from various committees and organizations related to management of spinal cord injury. And you both took the initiative to uh, organize to create a new set of guidelines and again study uh, the most recent literature. So what led to the recent effort and um, the strategy for making the current guidelines? Yeah, so maybe I'll lead off and then, you know, Brian, Brian can also provide his uh, perspectives. So um, in 2017, uh, AO Spine, in partnership with other organizations, including the Cervical Spine Research Society, created a set of guidelines around the management of spinal cord injury. And these were done uh, using a new methodology, which has now become state of the art in the field of guidelines development called the GRADE process. And typically, guidelines are living documents and they need to be reevaluated every five to six years based on new evidence that had uh, evolved. So one of the topics um, that uh, was kind of a hot topic related to the role and timing of surgery in acute spinal cord injury. And in 2017, the evidence was really just emerging and it only enabled us to provide a, a relatively weak recommendation related to um, the role and timing of surgery. And subsequent to the 2017 guidelines, there were a number of publications that emerged and we felt that it was worthwhile to, uh, to re revisit this uh, topic. And then um, Brian's had a very active interest in hemodynamic management. So maybe over to you. Yeah, and I think that um... You know, I think one of the really important concepts was that the methodology for doing these kinds of guidelines has evolved. And I think we had a really great experience with this in 2017 when Michael led the acute SEI guidelines and degenerative cervical myelopathy guidelines. And we felt that really applying these guidelines to the literature uh, around knowledge gaps that are really important for spine surgeons would be important. And it was timely, you know. New evidence had come out around timing of surgery. We recognized that the guidelines for hemodynamic management had been published in 2013, and a lot has really been studied on this topic uh, over the last decade. Um, in addition to which, we wanted to apply the grade methodology to the guideline process. So I think this made it, uh, you know, a really good time to try to address that because I think that people had even begun to realize that. You know, the application of the hemodynamic guidelines from 2013 uh, were, you know, in some cases a bit hard to really implement. Um, you know, and people had questions about what should the MAP target be? How long should it be applied for? What agents to use to drive the blood pressure, uh, the role of spinal cord perfusion pressure? These are all things that I think, you know, were, were really not fully addressed to some extent, uh, and even the guidelines from 2013 uh, acknowledged that. So I think it was a good time to, to, you know, apply this methodology to that body of literature. And the third question that arose was a novel question, but an issue that 
is really one of the most dreaded complications in all of medicine and certainly in spine surgery. And this is an intraoperative spinal cord injury. And it, it happens to, to all of us in, in practice. And the challenge is, how do you prevent this from occurring? If it occurs, how do you make the diagnosis? And then how do you respond to say a monitoring alert in the operating room? What do you do? What's the appropriate protocol? And so we felt that it was timely to synthesize this evidence using the grade process. So a question for the client and the feelings. So how do you think people should use that guideline? What do they, is the guideline is, like how do they apply this guideline in their daily practice? Well, I think that, uh, you know, we had a session about guideline, the guidelines yesterday, and I think one of the really important points that was made um, by Dr. Failings was that, you know, these should not be interpreted as like a standard of care sort of message or a medical legal kind of framework for practice. These represent really the, the evidence as they exist today and, and really a, a way of looking at the evidence, not strictly as, well, as a scientifically a really high quality paper, a low quality paper, but kind of in the way that surgeons look at evidence, which is to evaluate it and then kind of weigh the balance of, of harms and benefits, which is actually quite intuitive about the way that we all view you know, decision-making. And I think the grade process tries to incorporate that in a way that's much more sophisticated than just saying, well, was that a high quality study or a low quality study? You know? An important element of the guidelines process relates to uh, knowledge dissemination. And we're very grateful to the North American Spine Society and to both of you as co-chairs of the Spinal Cord Injury uh, section of NAS to allow us the opportunity to disseminate these guidelines. And this relates to a process that's been referred to as the knowledge to action cycle. And so this is where one synthesizes the evidence, generate these guidelines, but then you need to um, uh, uh, disseminate these to um, clinicians in practice to see if they make sense, how, would, how does one, one apply these, and then where are they working, and then importantly, where are the knowledge gaps? And it's really, uh, you know, all of these elements, I think, become important. And so I think what's critical is for um, our community of spine practitioners to adopt and to use and apply the guidelines, but then also to provide feedback in terms of where they're working and perhaps where, where they're not working as well as we would like. So Dr. Kwan, um, so there seems to be quite a change from the hemodynamic guideline compared to 2013 ones. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, briefly mention the take home message for people to- Sure, yeah. So the previous guidelines in 2013 recommended that the mean arterial pre blood pressure be maintained between 85 and 90 millimeters of mercury for seven days. And based on our assessment of the literature and applying that to the grade process, we felt that really the evidence didn't support such a tight map target. And that if you really scrutinize the literature, the, the, the target really should be, it shouldn't be really so restrictive. And that because the evidence that supported that uh, relationship to neurological benefit was not really that strong and that the time and duration of that support really needed to be given some discretion to physicians. So our recommendation is that it be somewhere between 75 and 80 for the map is the lower end, between 90 and 95 at the upper end, and that we allow the duration to be kind of between three and seven days. I, I think that this is a, a very important uh, development in the guidelines and the range part potentially could be something uh, a little bit confusing to someone reading that range for the first time. So could either of you explain the concept behind having both a lower and upper limit and what, how should the practitioner interpret that? Yeah, well, I think that uh, what we found from our assessment of the literature was that, you know, you know, if you allow the mean arterial blood pressure to drop, people fear, well, is that gonna induce further ischemic injury? But really, below sort of 75 to 80, there was not a lot of strong evidence to suggest that patients did worse. So we thought that that was a more realistic sort of target or a lower limit to apply. On the upper end, we, what we found was that when you looked at data, and some of which had been produced out of UCSF, that there was not really um, 
strong benefit to pushing the map beyond 95. And in fact, people started to experience some vasopressor related complications with that. So we thought that made sense as a more rational kind of upper ceiling. Um, and so that's sort of where we emerged at the, uh, with that sort of broader window for an acceptable map target. Dr. Uh, so the, uh, the time guidelines, um, I noticed that this time they make a bit stronger recommendation of the surgery within 24 hours. How do you think the people, uh, and does it apply to all kinds of scenario with complete spinal cord injury or mild spinal cord injury? And how do you think we can help people to implement that 24 hour guideline? Yes, thank you. So in, in essence, based on a synthesis of the evidence, and on this occasion, we were able to undertake a quantitative meta-analysis of the literature. And the literature was now felt to be of a much higher quality than before. And grade is quite stringent, but the evidence was felt to be of a, a moderate level of quality and a strong recommendation emerged that um, uh, given that the patient is medically stable, that um, any patient with an acute spinal cord injury, regardless of level and regardless of severity of injury, undergo a surgical intervention within 24 hours. Now, having said that, um, you know, there's kind of room for interpretation. So is there a role for ultra early surgery? And I, I would say that the principle is that time is spine and that if the patient's medically stable and if you've got the logistics in place and infrastructure in place to do earlier surgery, that that's, a, that's very reasonable and that should be undertaken. There's obviously nothing magical about 24 hours versus 23 versus 25 hours, which was the question that arose uh, uh, yesterday. Um, and then the issue kind of arises around, you know, the management of the elderly patients. And increasingly we're seeing geriatric individuals who have medical comorbidities, they may be on a factor 10A inhibitor, their judgment is required and it may not be safe to take the patient to surgery in the first 24 hours. And that's completely acceptable and understandable. And it's reasonable to undertake surgery in that patient in a more delayed uh, fashion. And we would still argue that, that, that surgery is, will be a benefit in, in that patient. And I would just maybe add that it's not that we think that because we did not make a recommendation around ultra early surgery that we don't think that there's a benefit to, you know, trying to undertake surgical decompression as soon as possible. But it was really around what evidence was available. And there were really four studies that were included in the systematic review. And really the definition of ultra early was variable. And the, and the, the results that came out of it were actually a bit contradictory. So it didn't actually provide an evidentiary basis to say, yes, there's a strong, we could make a strong recommendation or even really a recommendation around ultra early. So, so I think it's a very important point that, you know, we don't believe that something magical happens at 24 hours. We think that there is a, you know, there's a pathophysiological secondary cascade that is occurring that probably benefits from being, um, from being, you know, arrested in some fashion by surgical decompression but that the evidence wasn't really there for the early, ultra early um, uh, recommendation. And so that was identified as one of the critical knowledge gaps that, that exists. And there may be an opportunity to actually synthesize the existing literature to come to a firmer conclusion, which for which there was a, a precedent in our, in our Lancet neurology meta-analysis, or to look at alternative ways to try to tackle this uh, question. I think one of the unique things about this set of guidelines was just the strategy for formulating them and using the grade process and not only uh, looking at available literature, but then also having a panel of experts vote on that literature. So could either of you comment on the grade process who our listeners might not be familiar with and, and the way these guidelines were formulated? Yeah, so maybe I'll, I'll tackle that as the, the, the NAS EBM chair because NAS has made a concerted effort to bring grade in, into, into the processes. And so uh, what, what's, um, I think, relevant about the grade process is really regardless of the evidence, a recommendation can be made. So this is quite different from you know, previous uh, approaches where if the evidence really was insufficient, 
the conclusion was we can't make a recommendation, and so then you're you, you know you're, you're you're stumped. So the process is essentially is a two part process. The first involves undertaking syst systematic reviews, which are of a high quality. They're registered on Prospera. They're done according to uh, quite a rigorous protocol. Then that evidence is synthesized through a guidelines development group, which needs to be multidisciplinary in nature. All of the conflicts need to be vetted. It's okay if people have opposing views, that's fine. But everyone on the guidelines development group needs to be willing to, um, to, to compromise and to support uh, the consensus opinion. And what's also important with that multidisciplinary group is that it, it includes non-surgeons and it also includes individuals with lived experience. So people with spinal cord injury are part of that process, which becomes quite important, say, if you're assessing, well, how important are relatively small Im improvements in function? So a question. So um, a lot of the evidence from the hemodynamic, uh, very low level of mm -hmm. evidence. So how can people work with that and the generating, how, how do we as a spine community generate high quality evidence that can, yeah. can make that recommendation stronger? stronger? Yeah, and I think that uh, we identify that as a key knowledge gap in our, in our guideline. And, and clearly when you really scrutinize the literature and, and I think uh, you know, Michael has made this point before that it can be a very humbling experience to have your own literature graded in the grade process. Um, because I'm part of that evidentiary um, uh, body my, with some of our papers. And, um, and I think that, you know, I think we will need better prospective studies that, um, and, you know, probably utilizing multi-institutional networks to get really large numbers and then applying, you know, some of the novel techniques around, uh, you know, doing big data analysis to really try to tease out what is the effect of, you know, MAP augmentation, of spinal cord perfusion pressure augmentation on, uh, on neurological outcome. Um, and this, um, you know, this is a problem that, um, you know, stems, uh, it really applies to all aspects of acute spinal cord injury, because you could substitute into that question, like, what is the effect of a drug on neurological outcome? What is the effect of uh, surgery on a certain outcome? And, and all those questions are very challenging to to do in small scale studies, and I think, you know, we're I think we're learning about, you know, the kinds of um, multi institutional efforts that are going to be required for that, the kind of data, the kind of analytical techniques, the application of biomarkers to to better understand the heterogeneity of injury, so that we can better predict outcome and then try to discern the effect of treatments. So. Um, I think those are the kinds of things that we're going to need in the next five to 10 years to, you know, to enhance that evidentiary base. So we talked a little bit about timing of surgery and about perfusion. And the last aspect of the guidelines was on uh, the uh, potential for intraoperative spinal cord injury. How do we protect against that, monitor against that? Um, what were some of the key takeaways uh, regarding that topic? So I think w w one of the the key messages is to try to destigmatize this and that to acknowledge that this is a complication that occurs. It, it occurs to excellent surgeons, you know, um, under the most stringent circumstances. So I think that's important to get the message out there. So we arrived at a definition, which uh, is essentially a, a, a change in spinal cord function that occurs intraoperatively that's either diagnosed by electrophysiology, by a wake-up test, or post-operatively in the initial period with clinical assessment. We came up with a table of what we felt was um, criteria that would suggest which patients were of high risk. And then based on the available literature and a lot of discussion through the um, expert panel, uh, came up with a proposed care pathway, which we, which we proposed that essentially involves recognizing that the patient is of higher risk, multidisciplinary preoperative discussions, the availability for adjuncts intraoperatively. And there was a recommendation that um, evoke potential monitoring be available for uh, such patients. And then there was a suggested a protocol for when an intraoperative monitoring change might 
occur that essentially involves looking at surgical factors, looking um, at the electrophysiology, mainly making sure that it, that that there wasn't a technical issue, and then looking at, at, at anesthetic factors, um, including ensuring that the mean arterial blood pressures were being ma maintained at an appropriate range. And I think that going forward, one of the kind of the, the, the key take homes from this is that we're hoping that people will consider the adoption of this care pathway and then to try it out and then to generate prospective data which uh, potentially could validate the protocol and then perhaps also provide suggestions for how the protocol might evolve in the future. So one of the components of that recommendation is for high-risk patients, you recommend a group discussion happen prior to the surgery. I think that raises some concerns the surgeon take away surgeon's autonomy and decision for the surgery. What do you think of that? Well, I think that... Um... You know, I think that most surgeons can kind of recognize what they think is a high risk case. And I think that, um, you know, as, as Michael said, I think that one of the object, one of the things we hope will emerge from this is a destigmatization around the fact that we do tackle cases that do come with neurological risk. And, uh, and one of the, I think the, you know, key elements of that is the actual anticipation of that ahead of time. You know, do people need, do surgeons need to be making, you know, group decisions about what, you know, constitutes high risk in their, in their practices? Well, probably not, but, but certainly the, the notion that, okay, if you feel like you have somebody at high risk, all right, well, then what is the pathway? What is, what, what's the framework? Well, you know, talking to anesthesia ahead of time, talking to, you know, anticipating what the care needs will be, um, medical optimization before that. These are things that are, you know, obviously not, um, you know, rocket science to, to surgeons, but I think just having it out there to make people think about these things in, uh, in the context of, uh, of, you know, potential risk of neurological um, uh, injury. Um, so I don't think we are necessarily recommending that, that, you know, surgical decision be making be made in a sort of a, in some sort of group think, but, but really to, to have surgeons be thinking about, okay, you know, what are the resources that I should maybe engage, you know, in the lead up to doing that. And then, and then of course, the whole management of the situation that occurs, which is obviously very stressful and, and, and how do people navigate that when they're in it. Um, and, you know, for those of us that have had that experience, I think we've all had that experience. It's, it's one thing, but I think certainly to have something out there that might guide, you know, young surgeons, new surgeons, trainees in the in helping them through an experience that they will likely have at some point in time in their career, I think is an important thing to have out there. So something similar to like basically make anesthesiologists aware this is a high risk mm -hmm. surgery. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure the map didn't drop during the case. We need to make sure we get steroid prior to the surgery. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure everyone in the room knows this is a high risk patient so that people are not too relaxed during that case. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that uh, like, like other aspects of our of our surgical practices, advanced planning generally pays off in the recognition of the patient. And again, as Brian had said, like you know, we provided you know suggestions in a table form, but you know it's it's the surgeon's judgment. And then the idea is just to make preparations in advance, and then also to have a protocol in place. So if there is a change. You know, it's important to stay cool and that everyone really be focused on on the protocol. And I think when a problem occurs, it's really helpful to have a protocol because it's very stressful and you can rely on the procedures and the protocol and everyone is kind of speaking the same language. So we've been able to cover the three main topics that uh, will be seen in, in the uh, coming guidelines. Any other concluding thoughts or, or key takeaways that you'd like the, the listener to get from, from the new guidelines? Uh, the guidelines will be published in the next two to three months in the Global Spine Journal, and these will be open access. Um, we're very grateful, again, to NAS to allow us the opportunity to look at knowledge dissemination. We hope that there'll be some future opportunities, and I think we've been able to um, identify a number of key knowledge gaps we want to go forward. And I think 
finally, I think there's, you know, uh, acknowledgements and maybe I'll ask Brian to comment on all the people and organizations we need to acknowledge. Sure. So this was a, uh, uh, a really uh, uh, intensive effort that was uh, co-sponsored between AO Spine and the Praxis Spinal Cord Institute. And uh, we had uh, methodological support from, uh, from aggregate who were very helpful in the 2017 guidelines and really uh, added a lot of methodological rigor to the process. So we have a lot of people to thank for that. And, and really, we had really great engagement from multiple uh, surgeons, neurologists, anesthesiologists, intensivists, and individuals living with spinal cord injury that participated in the guideline process, which um, really added a lot. Because you know, in those discussions when you're voting, it is important to have people living with spinal cord injury weigh in on what they think is important, what they think is acceptable, how they view um, uh, uh, differences and changes in, the, in how they view the literature and evidence. So, so by incorporating their uh, uh, voice into the guidelines, I think that really added a lot. And so we have a lot of them to thank for that as well. And, uh, uh, and uh, I think that it's also important to, for the people that read the guidelines to understand, as Michael pointed out, these are living documents. Um, this represented where we were today. Um, and we understand that, um, that evidence is going to be added. And we hope that uh, we'll raise discussion, that people will test drive them, and that we'll have an opportunity to update them as they should be updated in, in five or six years. So I want to ask one more last question, maybe. Uh, so on the picture brain, so since you guys work on the guidelines, you probably know what's missing there and what's the knowledge gap. What do you think the spine community should work on in the field of spinal cord injury to make the, the, the treatment, the management of spinal cord injury more beneficial? Like what's the area they identified really, really lacking? Well, you gave a fantastic talk at yesterday's symposium, really kind of summarizing this. I think from the aspect of the guidelines that we've generated, each of the topics has identified knowledge gaps. So in the timing of surgery, what's the role of ultra early surgery? What constitutes an adequate decompression? How do we do the surgery and other technical aspects of that? Hemodynamics, as Brian has indicated, we need prospective data, um, probably big data approaches to validate what I think makes a lot of sense and what's supported by basic science, but we still lack clinical evidence. And I think for the intraoperative spinal cord injury guidelines, I think we need to test drive the, um, you know, the, the care pathways that we've developed. In the broader context of spinal cord injury, uh, you know, there's a whole topic of neuroprotection. There's some recent trials that have emerged that are, are interesting. There are trials in the works with, um, novel approaches targeting no-go, RGMA. There's neural stem cell strategies that are, that are emerging, biomaterials-based strategies, as, as well as um, uh, electrical stimulation of areas in the nervous system. And so I think the next 10 years is actually gonna be a remarkable uh, uh, era. And I think that spinal cord injury represents, I think, an extremely exciting area for uh, young investigators to get involved with because there's a, a tremendous amount of knowledge that's emerging and we have fantastic tools and i'm hoping that in the future you know we won't be debating the role and timing of surgery or human mm -hmm. management but we'll be discussing cool regenerative options and neuroprotective options which i think would be an amazing development well, I would uh, just like to thank Dr. Failings and Dr. Kwan for uh, taking the lead on uh, these uh, new AOPraxis guidelines. I think they're going to contribute a lot uh, to the literature and to the management of uh, spinal cord injury patients and, and really help the community at large manage these patients the best way we can. So thank you both and thanks for involving us on the NAS Spinal Cord Injury Committee and allowing us to participate. Mm -hmm.